have one other, two other, one other co. Who else is a co-founder here? Dave's a co-founder. We have any other co-founders here? No, that's striking. Actually, one of them couldn't make it. But thank you, Dave. I was just pointing that out. So, uh, so I'm a co-founder. I want to talk about why we're talking about this transformation thing and where this all came from. So we've heard a lot today about some of the challenges in our current healthcare system. In fact, Danny Van Leeuwen told us about most of them, I think. <laughs> so we have an epidemic of chronic disease. We have an aging population. We have patients with rising expectations as these uppity consumers. We've got rising costs. We've got increased complexities of healthcare. And we have poor exchange and coordination of information across the healthcare system. And finally, but not least in, in importance, we have declining patient and provider satisfaction. Huge problems for our healthcare system. And yet, I can't stand back here. This is a bad place to stand. And yet we kind of think about, we kind of think about healthcare as if it were a car wash. A car wash. Why is healthcare like a car wash? You know, we talk about healthcare as if it's like this service industry, and it's like going to the store or something like that. It's not. It's like a car wash. What I mean by that is that both patients and providers are not very actively engaged in this. The patient is the car. They're, they're unhealthy. They're dirty. So they're passing through this healthcare system, and somehow health gets sprinkled on them as they pass through that healthcare system, and they come out the other side, and, and they're, they're healthy. It's, it's a miracle. I'm cured. But, the fa but that car is not engaged in the process. The car wash doesn't give a damn. And is it any wonder that we have the healthcare system that we've been talking about, okay, where nobody's happy with it, it's costing a lot of money, we're not getting the outcomes we, we want. So that's a huge problem. So what should healthcare be? What should we be doing about healthcare? How should we reconceive healthcare? Well, I would suggest to you that we should think about healthcare not just as a service or anything that we talk about it as, but it should be a collaboration. A collaboration where the topic is between a patient and a clinician, and the topic is that patient's health. So one of my patients, pictured here, sitting right there, by the way, this is the first time I've spoken to an audience that has more than one of my patients in it. It's quite <laughs> remarkable. Um, I think three, if I'm counting correctly. But anyhow, so, so we're, we're the team here, right? This is the team. And in healthcare, we talk about healthcare teams, but we talk about, well, you got the no doctor and the nurse practitioner and the clinical nurse and the pharmacist and the psychologist. That's not the healthcare team I'm talking about. Maybe that's part of it, but I'm talking about fundamentally the provider and the patient. That's the collaboration I'm talking about. And collaboration applied to healthcare is participatory medicine. All right, now think about collaboration for a second. Think about collaboration. How many of you collaborate in any aspect of your life? Forget about healthcare. Everybody does, right? You're collaborating around, you know, with your spouse, around how you're going to take care of your house, your kids. You're doing research collaborations, business collaborations, whatever. So let's talk about five things that are important to a successful collaboration of any kind. So the first is open communication. Okay, got to be communicating to make this thing work. The second is making shared decisions. We had a whole panel about shared decision makings. Making, sorry. Mutual respect. The people who are collaborating with one another need to respect each other or this is not going to work well. Next, it's full sharing of information. Okay? When you're collaborating with people at work, researchers, whatever, you, if you're hoarding information or somebody's hoarding information, that is not going to work. And finally, there needs to be engagement. Engagements by all parties. Okay, so we, both, we all need to be engaged in this thing. Okay? If you're in a meeting and there's somebody who's checking their email while they're supposed to be in the meeting focusing, that's a problem. That's going to be a collaboration that's not going to work well. So that's what we're talking about. So now I want to introduce someone to you that uh, thank you, thankfully Dave mentioned earlier. This is Dr. Tom Ferguson. And Tom was a dear friend of mine until he died in 2006. But back in, so, so Tom was a doctor, but he never practiced medicine. Instead, he became an observer of healthcare. He wrote a lot about healthcare and how it really could be different. He was interested in self care, he was interested in patients becoming e patients. He invented this term, e patients. 
Really remarkable what Tom did. The E that Tom talked about, even though he talked about it in the age of the internet and the web, he realized the power of that, but the E has nothing to do with that. The E that Tom talked about was engagement. That's the E that Tom meant. So the E was about patients who are engaged. They're equipped, they're empowered, they're educated, and they're enlightened. That's the kind of E we're talking about. So all of you who are patients in this room are E patients. E patients are really critical. And what we want is we want everybody to become an E patient, every individual, every citizen to become an E patient. And we want a healthcare system that welcomes their engagement and their involvement as E patients. We want that collaboration. I want to talk about something else that Tom wrote about, which is, is I think, really powerful. Tom said, you know, when we're in healthcare and we're talking to our healthcare buddies, what do we do? We talk about primary care, we talk about secondary care, and we talk about tertiary care. That is our view of the world as doctors and healthcare professionals. But that kind of reminds me of that old New Yorker magazine, which is the New Yorker's view of the world, where you have an amplified all the, you know, magnified all the, uh, the uh, uh, sites in New York, and then the further and further you get away from New York geographically, you have like nothing there. There's like a cow that represents the whole Midwest, and then eventually there's a Golden Gate Bridge. So we're seeing this in a very skewed way. But this is our view of the world. It's primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. What Tom said is, you know what? There's a whole other part of the world that nobody talks about, and it's bigger and a hell of a lot more important, and that's self-care. That's the 99.999% of people's lives that they are outside of the healthcare system. It's what they're doing on their own. And, and that self-care stuff, we don't talk about it too much, as much as we should, and he noted that that was sort of almost discouraged where we encourage people to come into the traditional healthcare system and get their primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. That's where the money is. But from a healthcare system, that's where it's getting expensive. So Tom called this in 1995 when he wrote about it, he called this industrial age medicine. And what Tom said is we need to turn this on its head. We need to emphasize individual self-care friends and families, self-health networks. And then sometimes people can proceed to professional care, which is totally recast as professionals, as facilitators, professionals as partners, and sometimes, in some situations, professionals as authorities. But that's not the norm. And Tom called that information age health care. And this is the model that we should all strive for. And it's, it's amazing to me that Tom was prescient enough to have written this in 1995. Amazing. All right, so we're talking about changing the culture of healthcare, and that's what all of this is about. We're moving from an age of information asymmetry to an, inf to an age of information symmetry. We're moving from a, a world in which patients are passive recipients of information to patients being active partners. We're moving from paternalism to autonomy and participation. We're moving from a patient-physician relationship, which is at the same time a consumer-provider relationship. This, this is changing the culture of healthcare, and this is what we want to move to. The, the uh, Society for Participatory Medicine started a long time ago, 1995, Ferguson defined e-patient. Starting in about 2001, I started getting involved with Tom, and he was bringing together a group of people who were trying to think differently about healthcare. Um, I was interested in how the internet's changing the, what consumers do with healthcare, and I was using email with patients back in the early 90s, if you can believe that, that's crazy. Um, and, and we had people who were running um, um, information websites for parents of kids, a pediatric information website, people who are running online support communities, people who are uh, having drug information sites, people are researchers, interesting group of about a dozen people. And we would get together each year, brought together by Tom, and we talk about how we can make healthcare better, how we could transform healthcare. Um, Dave mentioned the, uh, the e-patient uh, uh, paper, the e-patient white paper, and I won't go into that. If you go to our website, you can download that paper. But that was a really important paper, and that paper became a rallying cry for all of us who were trying to change healthcare. 
And after Tom died in 2009, we got together and David joined the group in that point and we decided we're going to make this dream a reality. We're going to do something about it and not just talk about it. And that's when we created the Society for Participatory Medicine. And we created this, or oops, sorry, we created this organization in a very interesting way, which is that we said we don't want to be just a patient rights organization. And we don't want to be just a regular healthcare society. We want to be everything. We want members who span the healthcare spectrum. Patients, caregivers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, entrepreneurs, doesn't matter. Want them all together because that's where you get uh, a rich uh, fertilization of ideas. And we wanted to keep the dues low so that it wouldn't be a barrier. We have patients in our organization who can't afford even a very low amount of, of dues and we wanted them to be able to join us. We wanted an open access a journal that you heard Sue Woods talk about earlier. Those are the kind of things that we wanted to do with this organization. So participatory medicine is a movement in which patients and healthcare professionals actively collaborate and encourage one another as full partners in health. Visit our website. If you're not a member, please become a member. And by the way, we are having this sale that Joe told you about. But in addition, the lifetime membership fee in this organization costs about as much as a year's membership in many other organizations that some of us belong to. So we, um, do you want to talk about this part or not, the four pillars? No, she said, no Sarah. <laughs> okay, let, let me just say that the things that we do, so besides running the organization, we're trying to move the ball forward. And we do this in four categories of work effort. And I want you to all know about these things. One is community. We're bringing together all these diverse stakeholders to talk about what are the problems and what are potential solutions to share ideas. We have an online communication collaboration platform that we use to do that, have incredible conversations. And you can, and, and Peter, is, uh, Peter and Dave actually are the two leaders of this group. It's called SPM Connect. And it's really amazing the kind of conversations that take place there. And even without joining, you can sort of go in there and see a teaser of what's being talked about. But to really participate, you've got to be a member. But it's really been a phenomenal tool for us. So the community is important. Next is advocacy. Is Vera here? Where's Vera? Is Vera Rulon in the back? She was here earlier. OK, so Vera Rulon is running this group. What we're doing, and, and Dave Harlow is a member of this group as well. So what we're doing is we've, we've been in the past uh, very reactive, so that when the feds are putting forth a policy, a payment policy or a transparency policy, what it is, we had a group of people who got together and said, we should respond to this. Here's how we should respond. And Dave was running this group uh, for a while. And, and, and that was great. And we found out from the people in Washington, they really did listen to us. But now it's a new era and we're going to become, be, we're becoming more proactive. So what Vera and her team are doing is they're figuring out what issues we may be proactive about to advocate for, for our members. Next there's research. So we don't do research today. But what we do do is we publish research in our peer-reviewed journal, the Journal of Participatory Medicine. We also have a project that's, that's really interesting, that's just in the formative stages. It's called the Research Library. At least one of our speakers today mentioned the Cochrane Library. Do you guys remember that? And some of you know what that is anyhow. And that's a great place where you can look up the best clinical, uh, the best evidence for different things we do in medicine. Well, what this is going to be is it's going to be a research library which is focused on answering questions about participatory medicine. What is the best, best evidence, best clinical evidence for patient portals, for transparency, for medication reminders, whatever it is, we're going to have that information in the research library. So that's going to be a very exciting project, and that's being led by uh, uh, Fernando Martin Sanchez, who's one of the uh, big muckety mucks at the Department of Health in, uh, in Spain, actually. And then uh, finally is education. And Peter Elias is here, uh, who stood up at the microphone earlier. And, and Peter is heading up this initiative. And this is a big honking initiative, and we need a lot to help on this. And the idea here is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The idea here is, well, we started out by saying, well, you know, we got to educate those damn doctors because they stink at this, right? And it's true. We need to do that. We need to educate healthcare professionals. But we also realize that it takes two parties to make a car wash. And we have a lot of patients who are very comfortable being that car. I'm sick, doctor. Fix me. Or they get terrified because they don't know what to say to go in and talk to their doctor. They don't know how to 
you know, really engage in a, in a useful discussion. They don't know how to do the research. There's so much that they can learn. So we want to focus on education of patients and caregivers. And then on both of these, we need to move upstream, ultimately. We need to get doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals when they're in pre-professional education. And for patients, well, we should be teaching this stuff when kids are in school. When they're in middle school, they're getting health class, they should be learning how to become e-patients. So those are our goals in education. A little project that I'm sure you'll handle, Peter, by the end of the day. That might take a week. A week, okay. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're a membership organization. We try to be totally transparent, and we have uh, uh, people like Peter uh, and, uh, and others that are trying to make us even more transparent in what we do. We're very connected via social media, and we're a volunteer organization. Everything that we do is done by us, okay? The people who ran this conference, we don't have any professional staff. I don't want it to be that way forever. I want that to change. I want us to be able to afford professional staff, but right now it's all volunteers. But that's an opportunity because people have, people have come up to me just in the last couple of days saying, you know, I remember when you recruited me to do something, you know, a couple of years ago and, and, you know, it was meaningful. It, it, it really meant something. And I think people who participate in this conference understand that as well. It's really great opportunity for building uh, new connections, building new skills and so on. And then finally, we're open to all. Low dues, if you can't afford even our low dues, we, we will give people free, uh, free, free dues, and we have patient travel grants. Our members, as I said, span the health to healthcare spectrum, I won't go into that, and all of the things we've been talking about today are participatory medicine. It's cultural transformation, it's self-care, it's personalized medicine, shared decision-making, transparency, patient experience, all of this. So why participatory medicine? Because ultimately, we want to keep down costs. We want to improve satisfaction for both patients and physicians and other staff. And then we want better outcomes. And so that is the triple aim. But because it includes the staff as well, it's actually the quadruple aim. So that's why we're doing this. It really does make a difference. And it makes a difference in the lives of patients. And that's really what's so important here as well. So this has been quoted a number of times today. This is uh, my dear friend and uh, friend and mentor, uh, Warner Slack, who wrote, the largest and least utilized healthcare resource worldwide is the patient, him or herself. Now that's a remarkable statement, but it's all the more remarkable when you look at the bottom and you see he wrote this in 1976. And we're not there yet, folks. All right, so we need your engagement. Join us as we work to transform uh, patient care. Thank you very much. All right.